Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up, the podcast for marketers working in early and late stage startups. I'm Morgan McClintic, the CEO of startup marketing agency Firebrand. We've launched this podcast to interview the best in the business, but I'm not going to do it alone. So please meet my co hosts. I'm Nicole Pytel, Firebrand's VP of Content Marketing. And I'm Chris Ulbricht, Firebrand's Head of Media Relations. I'm Ian Lipner, a tech PR and crisis communications veteran. We'll drop a new episode each week, so there's plenty of fuel for your marketing fire. Get the spark you need to take your startup to a whole new level. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a fresh edition of Fired Up. I'm Morgan McClintic. And I'm Nicole Pytel. And today we're going to be talking about account-based marketing with someone who's been in the trenches implementing it for the first time at their startup. Uh, his name is Bill O'Dell, and he's the former CMO of Aerospike. Yeah, Bill is is fantastic. And when you say he has been there, done that, absolutely. We're really excited to talk to him about you know, how do you know if you're ready to start ABM? Everybody's talking about it. Is it right for you? How do you do it? What works? What doesn't? What's really hard? What's maybe a little less hard than you think? So a lot of great stuff from Bill. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. I think this is uh, an area that lots of companies are moving into. You don't necessarily need to buy a great big platform, or but maybe you do. I'm interested to hear about that. And it doesn't always go well. So I wonder, maybe you can share some of the mistakes that they made, because for sure, this is a motion where you're really focusing on specific target accounts that you work with your sales team to really narrow down where you're focusing your marketing on through the advertising, email, et cetera, and really engaging those accounts. It's much more efficient than the sort of a broader play. Therefore, very interesting. And traditionally, the platforms, demand base, Sixth Sense, et cetera, that have enabled this have really only been available to enterprises, but they're coming down scale. But there's lots you can do without that. So maybe you don't even need one of those things. Looking forward to uh, talking to Bill. Let's uh, call him in. So, hey, Bill, welcome to Fired Up. Hey, good to see you guys. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you. Look, for those that don't know you, perhaps you could just quickly uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. I uh, often answer that question, um, not by just walking through my resume, but by saying I am a B2B thriving CMO. I have uh, <laughs> built my career from the trenches up over uh, more than 25 years doing the work at the individual contributor level across every function in marketing, field marketing, channel marketing, product marketing, product management, AR, PR, demand gen, you name it, and got to the executive level by learning and making a lot of mistakes and constantly trying to do better and better. Done big companies, small companies, security, SaaS, cloud data, lots of different domains, but my passion is growth stage B2B startups where you have some product market fit, but where you really got to figure out how do you build a repeatable go-to-market. And I tend to think about strategy first and execution second, but they're critical to do both. You can't just do strategy without execution, and you can't do execution without strategy. So where I focus my times now as a fractional CMO is on helping companies put together the right strategy and combining it with the right execution, because I think that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah, we always say that the, often the tactical, what you can do has to inform the, the strategy. So I, I love that hands-on approach. And today we're going to be talking about ABM. And one article that caught my eye, which is in search engine land, is about some trends uh, for 2024. And an interesting data point here that they said that, oh, look, hyper-targeting strategies like ABM are popular in B2B, but because of the increase in cost in those targeted traffic and because of people churning jobs so quickly, there's going to be a decrease in adoption of that because the cost per acquisition is just is too high compared to a, just a broad-based approach. And I'm not sure if I agree with that, but I wondered what you thought. <laughs> uh, I don't agree with that. I mean, I read the article and, and I looked at the numbers. And you know, I think it comes down to, again, if you have a good ABM strategy coupled with good ABM execution, the data on it in terms of reduced cycle times for sailing, the increased ACVs and all that are, are just compelling. And this isn't just me saying it. This has been you know researched for a long time. So 
I appreciate what the article said, but I think it, the devil's in the details. And there is a cost to complexity, but there is a return on that if you do it right. If you couple it with what we used to do, which was the spray and pray, and you need to just hope through sheer volume and force of will, somehow somebody would stumble across all the noise you were throwing out there and come to you. It's just that somebody has to convince me that's more efficient. And I, I just don't believe I just don't believe that's true. I believe in ABM. I think it's here to stay. I think most B2B companies that I know and CMOs that I respect are still going down that path. And again, I think it's just did you have the right strategy and the right execution to make it deliver on on the results? So let's start with that sort of basics then. I agree, like big companies are moving towards ABM. But when we say that, what do we mean? What's the difference between an ABM strategy and that sort of a broader based marketing approach? You know, it seems kind of silly. <laughs> you know, in retrospect, when we weren't thinking ABM, you know, now you look at it and you go, well, what were we thinking about? I mean, it's all about who's your target market? What market is the right market for your solution, right? And ABM is all about targeting your ICP, your ideal customer profile. How well do you know that? How well did you define that? Lots of ways you can define that. But that is the essence of good marketing is really understanding your customer, right? And so to a certain degree, ABM is just basic marketing, right? It, it should be anyway. And you click down on that. Well, how do you segment that market? There's a lot of it. Said. You can segment by size of company, vertical, region. You could segment by Companies that are growing, companies that are shrinking, uh, there's strategies to go after companies that are shrinking. You can go by companies uh, based upon how much money they've raised and are they high growth companies? I mean, there's a lot of ways, but I think the essence of ABM is just basically good marketing, which is understanding what market are you serving? And that changes over time, right? Over time, you might serve multiple markets. And so you have to be ready for that transition as you sort of, as your business matures, but it's just good business sense to think about it as a marketing person. And, you know, you think about the consumer people, they're extremely good at researching who their customers are. And they're so good at customer behavior. They get it down to, do you have a white picket fence or not? You know, and do you read Sports Illustrated or Popular Mechanics, right? And, you know, those basic ideas still apply, apply to B2B, right? I think people from B2C and those learnings are really good to apply. So do you understand your ideal customer profile? And within that, do you know your buyer persona? You know, do you understand the buyer committee, as we often refer to it? Because there usually isn't one buyer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to your point, it's it's kind of like common sense. Why did this take so long to become such a such a talking point? But it is a talking point for for many organizations, especially at startups. And so, when you were at Aerospike, what kind of was the trigger to move to more of an an account based type of of strategy as opposed to just, you know, the big wide spray and pray? Like what were the actual kind of catalysts for that? A great question. So when I was brought in, the company was pretty much stuck in one one market segment. I mean, we people don't know this, but Aerospike is the database that powers most of the big ad tech platforms. I mean, you name any of the big platforms have been around, Aerospike is the database of choice because it, it's just uniquely situated to handle those workloads. But as the VP of sales explained to me coming in, you know, we might be the least valuable, most successful company on the planet if we don't figure out a way to get out of ad tech. So the challenge was, is how would we get out of ad tech and go into a different market segment? So as I went through and talked to customers about that, and we started to think about the segmentation, and we did a pretty simple vertical segmentation, we had some early customers in financial services, and we said, can we replicate that? And that just led itself to an account-based strategy. So could you create a list of target accounts in the financial services market? And could you offer up specific content, specific messaging? Could you approach them in a way where you could get across that you understood their challenges and you could be helpful to them? And when you say financial services, well, you're talking insurance or banks or hedge funds or digital payment systems or what have you, that, that's, that's kind of noise, but it was a right strategy to help us break out of a segment and open up a new segment so that we could demonstrate to the market investors <laughs> that we did have a, an offering that would span multiple verticals. And we did, and we were successful in, in doing that. So this was a strategy where the company had traction in one vertical, needed to get into another one to expand its addressable market. You maybe thought, hey, look, 
ad serving uh, or social media platforms are very similar in terms of fast transactions than fraud detection. So let's go into fraud detection in this particular area. We know there are particular companies there that we can go in, but it is it is an experiment. And so to make that experiment as focused as possible, you thought, okay, we're not going to just market to everyone in payments. We're going to actually narrow down into a particular companies and particular people within that company? Did you get down into that target list that you worked with that VP of sales to kind of go, okay, it's these guys that we're going to go first, and then we'll we'll move on from there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, what I did to address that was twofold. I read a lot about account-based marketing. You know, I, I know some of the people who are really smart. I actually hired some people to come in as consultants or contractors to help me and we ran two pilots, okay? And this is textbook. You don't go big, you don't spend a lot of money, you go small, you test, you iterate, you learn, and then you launch. And, and we did two pilots, it took us the better part of six months to refine and learn before we went big, okay? And we picked a set of accounts. Uh, we had a subject matter expert who came out of financial services who helped advise us on how to really message and how, and we had already created content, but we brushed up that content Fraud happened to be one of the topics. It's not the only topic, but we had great case studies around how people had used us to detect fraud, and that's a big deal in financial services. So we did all that, and then you know after the and and we got a very small pilot team of handpicked salespeople across the world, actually, and we got the VP of sales on board, and he was part of the whole plan. And you know, because at its core, the other beautiful thing about ABM and, and B2B is it by definition is a forcing function to get marketing and sales on the same page. And how many times have we heard marketing and sales were on the same page? Well, forgive me, that should never happen. But ABM sort of forces that because it's a very orchestrated strategy where marketing and sales agree on the accounts. We agree on how we're gonna how we're gonna approach them. What is marketing gonna do? How does the handoff from marketing to sales happen? What do the salespeople pick up? You know, how do we report on it? How do we track it? It is a very highly coordinated process. And we needed a couple of pilots to iron that out, honestly. And then you have systems level things. You got to think through because there's a MarTech element to this that you have to sort of consider. And, you know, I've sold a lot of software. Oh, it's easy. You can get up and go, you know what? It takes time. There's a learning curve. And even though it is easy at, the, at some value, there's a learning curve on how you how you configure these things and all that sort of jazz. So we did. We were very precise in how we targeted and how we thought about content and how we thought about messaging. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it sounds like you, one, kind of solved a, a big business problem that a a lot of businesses can't solve, and that's marketing and sales alignment. But you also did a really great job at mitigating risk. You know, you started small, you got some expert insights. Yeah, maybe it takes a little bit longer to get those campaigns into market, but you're really mitigating that risk. So even with all of those benefits and all of that risk mitigation, were there any objections that you had to overcome company-wide? Was everybody on board right from the start or did you have to convince anybody like, no, this is the way to go? And and if so, how did you do that? Well, if I back up a little bit, I started at Aerospike as a fractional VP of marketing, actually. And I was asked to come in and help out. And after a while of just trying to understand the business, I said to myself, self, this is a, a perfect company for ABM. And when I went and started floated that trial balloon by the VP of sales and the CEO, they looked at me like I had a third eye. I mean, they're like, I had no idea what I was talking about. I go, company's not ready for it. But when the CEO sent me an email or something on a weekend that said, hey, I'm hearing a lot about this ABM, I said, okay, the timing's right. Because if you don't have institutional buy-in all the way to the C-suite, it's really, really, really difficult. I don't know if that was an objection, but it was certainly something I had to sort of think through in terms of was the organizational ready for it. And I had plenty of other things to do. I mean, I had plenty of problems to solve that were more foundational. Once we got going, I mean, there is an expectation, I think, a certain level of impatience amongst salespeople. I've been in sales and I had a number and I'm impatient because I got to make my number and, you know, I want marketing to help me, right? But, you know, to expect that there's a light switch and you just turn it on and all of a sudden these accounts appear on your doorstep ready to sign up is just, it's not true and it takes time. And so one of the things we had to sort of constantly message was it's going to take time. You pre-write emails in LinkedIn in-mails and you script BDL with GAR calls and you try to come up with the right recipe of how those things are going to get somebody to even want to get on a phone call with you. And they don't always work. And sometimes it's not that they weren't good. It's just the buyer wasn't ready. So 
I think one of the biggest thing is, is just reminding the team that it takes time. It, it takes a lot of time. You know, it could take 18 months, 12 months, 18 months until the stuff really kicks in. And so you just have to say, be patient. But when you start to get traction, you start to get people on the call and you, you celebrate it and you go, what did you learn? And, you know, you try to replicate that. But there's a lot of, you know, salespeople are patient. You know, they got a number. They want it, <laughs> they want it now. And so you just have to constantly coach people through that. What other objections? Does it work? I, ha- I don't have financial services companies in my territory. You know, so they're doing nothing for me. Be patient. We have a rollout plan. We're going to have other verticals. We're going to start with one and we'll roll out others because it ultimately, if you don't organize your entire company around a vertical, and we didn't, we had regional you know, people, which is typical, you have to pay attention to be able to, how do you take care of the other people that still want marketing help, even though they're not, there's no accounts in their territory that line up with those particular target accounts. And so you know, what we did is we just rolled out verticals sort of successfully in, in succession to sort of address that dynamic. But at the end of the day, you know, sales, when I was in sales and I went from marketing to sales and I took over a team, I said, whatever marketing is telling us to do, we'll do whatever makes sense, but we got a number make and we're not going to wait for them. I am not going to tolerate somebody said I couldn't make my number because of marketing. We're going to go make it happen. That's how salespeople operate. And so salespeople don't sit around. But you do want them to be part of the campaign. But on the other hand, you expect them they're going to go off and you know do their own prospecting and you know make their own make their own noise. And so that's just expected. So it definitely sounds like a journey here. And there was the impetus, which was we need to get into a new sector. There was the timing they had to come together, like the maturity of the business. Let's just say, and. The company sales team was regionally based, which, as you say, is very common, but the the ABM motion by its very nature had to be verticalized. So there's kind of a mismatch there. You had to sort of put together a team. You mentioned you brought in, this is a new muscle that the business is building. You brought in some consultants on the outside. You brought in some subject matter experts in that vertical to kind of give you the credentials um, and credibility there and help sort of generate the content. But internally, what did the team look like? I know VP of sales and CMO are definitely part of it, but who else is on the team? I'm doing it right now with a client, by the way. You know, And one of the things I try to advise is, hey, look, pick the people that are the experimenters, the people that like to test things, You know, the people that are going to put in the effort, the people that don't get discouraged if it doesn't work, that they're going to come in and they're going to give us feedback and they're going to try to figure it out on their own. You just can't Nothing will substitute for having the right people on the initial team. You, you want to get somebody in the team that people in the sales team look up to. Because if that person says, yeah, this is really good, then the other salespeople go, man, I want to learn about this ABM thing and I want to get on board. You know, you want to create a little buzz, right? I mean, I was just asked the other day or I saw a post on LinkedIn around marketing people just need to advertise themselves internally. And it's true. I mean, you need to promote yourself. It's really important for marketing people to promote themselves in a company, not in a disingenuous way, but it's important for the company to understand what marketing, it's hard for people to know what marketing people to do. So how do you promote that? How do you make people feel good about it? How do you make people know when something is succeeding? Being bashful in marketing doesn't help. So getting some salespeople behind an initiative like that, hopefully it's successful and they'll help you communicate that and get credibility within the sales organization, organization to get on board is super, super, super important. We did that in both pilots. And we got some younger salespeople who were just gung ho <laughs> and, and eager and wanted to be part of something new and strategic. And so, yeah, I think you have to think, be thoughtfully about who's on your pilot team, not only to test it and get feedback, but also to get the right energy behind it. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, so much of the testing and the feedback and, and with the pilot program that naturally comes with having to share the results with the broader organization at some point in time. So. How do you know if ABM is working? Because the data tells the story. So what, what metrics are you looking at aside from closed fund revenue? What metrics do you look at? What signals do you look for along the way? Even something that shows just a little bit of, of progress in the right direction. In the pilot, it was sort of different than later on because when you're early on, you're looking for early indicators. So one of the things, and we used a particular ABM platform that we looked at was called Lyft. And what Lyft is, is how many of the accounts in your target market were visiting your website before and after. And what we looked at was how many of them are actually coming to the website. 
Like, did we see an inc- measurable increase in the number of people visiting the website? And we did. And then what you start to look at is things like, well, how much time did they spend on your website? Did they consume your content? So if they just came and bailed, well, that's not a good thing. But if they came and lingered, and if they came back again, and if they started to download your content, it's a pretty good sign that whatever you're doing is driving the right behavior. Later on, once we had gotten into it and a little bit further down the road, because it takes time, again, they're not necessarily in market, right? You wanted to see, were those accounts showing up in the pipeline? Like literally, could you associate those accounts to accounts that were showing up in the pipeline, being a salesperson, put a potential transaction in salesforce.com with a dollar figure on it that showed up as a a legitimate opportunity. What I like to say is if a salesperson puts something in Salesforce with a dollar figure on it, they better believe it because it's otherwise they're going to be grilled on it by their manager. Like, what's that going on? I got, we got a quarter to close. They don't do that haphazardly. They do it because they think it's real. And so what we measured over time was were companies that we're targeting showing up in the pipeline and was that growing quarter over quarter? And that was super important for us. And then what we would do once we rolled out new verticals is, is we'd say, well, how is vertical number two comparing to vertical number one? Was it growing at the same rate, the same velocity? And, and by the way, it wasn't, you know, because so one vertical flat out didn't work at all. So we just killed it. We said that was not a vertical that was good for us. But we started to look at different metrics at different phases of the program. Uh, I don't remember the close rates and all that, but we did get business down the road. But, you know, ours, our sale in particular could be a 12 to 18 month sale. So you wouldn't necessarily see that transact quickly, but it was good to see it, see things showing up in the pipeline. Within nine months, you'd start to see stuff showing, you know, things. You'd, we had a bar chart that we, we created a dashboard in Salesforce, you know, that showed all this stuff. So let's talk about the tech stack a little bit there. You mentioned, hey, how much time are people spending on the website? Like you're tracking in a quite a capillary level, demand base calls these engagement minutes. Like this person, how many minutes are they spending on our site, reading our emails, et cetera? And you can kind of then use those minutes as triggers to spark other actions. Hey, now send them this email or deliver them this website or invite them to this webinar or what have you, or have someone reach out or the engagement minutes go down. And now they haven't, they haven't come to the site a long time for a long time. We need to warm them back up again. So you do get a lot of information, but demand base is a pretty sophisticated platform. You launched with a pilot in two verticals on a six month sort of timeline. Talk to me about the platform, did you go all in on a like, hey, we're going to get six cents, we're going to go demand base, and like, which is a bit of a lift? Or did you start with something smaller? Hey, we're just going to build some custom match lists in Google Ads and LinkedIn to sort of replicate that before we get into this uh, larger platform. We went with a platform, you know, I guess is maybe because I had lived through the days of early days of Salesforce and Marketo that. And Demandbase, who we used, had been around, and they happened to be a customer of ours, but that wasn't the driving decision. We did put the pixels on our site to see, you know, how did they actually track visitors from certain accounts and all that sort of stuff. And we looked at their intent data and all that sort of stuff. But but we took a really hard look at, at Six Sense too, and there were pluses and minuses in, in both of them. I think they've changed since I did all that evaluation, both companies, but. You know, one of the things about demand base at the time was their analytics, in our opinion, was a little bit richer, potentially too rich. Like you could track and measure and report on anything. And it's like, no, let's just do the standard out of the box stuff to begin with, because the rest of it's like crazy about what you could customize. So, but we weren't afraid of that. Um, we did need to do some integrations with Salesforce and, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but that wasn't, we were technical enough to do that. Um, for people who don't have that technology, the prowess and, in house, make sure you can do that. The client I'm with right now does not, and we're not. We're, we're doing a, a lighter, a lighter way of approaching that technology wise or tech stack wise. But no, we we were fine with that. The, the metrics though that we kind of and what I what I was really keen on getting to, and I had to sort of customize this reporting. But you could pull it out of demand base and Salesforce. And, you know, everything ends up in an Excel spreadsheet, doesn't it? Was this notion that there's a marketing qualified lead and there's a marketing qualified account? 
And when you go down account-based marketing, what you want to look at is at the account level, are you doing a good job of getting those people engaged with you? So you're looking at engagement minutes and all those other things. And we did, and we did account scoring, and we had a, a way that we aggregated it all that to say, if it hits that threshold, much like a marketing qualified lead, that's a marketing qualified account. And then what we did is created an alert system where we would fire off an alert to the account owner and said, hey, here's an account that's actually hit the threshold. And then what we did is we embedded in that alert. And here's links to all the things you need. Here's your scripts. Here's your tools. Here's your case study. Here's everything for you to follow up. We ran that by some of the people that we used and the pilots that were consulting us. And they said that was best in class. They had never seen anybody do that. That's kind of great to say. I will say that I looked at the alerts and they were very dense and very complicated. So we had to go back. They weren't for mere mortals. You had to simplify it so salespeople could, you know, they they like paint by number, make it really simple to understand what that alert said. But we did get to that level of sophistication. I actually reached out to my network and talked to a guy about how he did it. And, you know, and we had sort of a account-based funnel and a lead-based funnel. And we were starting to track those side by side because you still want to look at the leads. But you also want to look at the accounts because that's what account-based marketing is. You know, as John Miller would say, leads don't buy, accounts buy. Salespeople aren't trying to sell, you know, they're trying to sell at the account level. And B2B, there's a buyer's committee. So you need to think broadly. And that's what ABM sort of offers us, I think. You had a platform and that would be the recommendation. So it was it was definitely an investment in order to sort of get down to that. And basically, the company was a level of sophistication. Yeah. For your audience, though, look, you don't have to start that way. You could start very simply without putting in all that market. So if you have if you're a company that doesn't have all that stuff, you can still go down ABM. And there's ways that you can have workarounds uh, to do that. If you have Salesforce or HubSpot, you know, some of them now have consolidated a lot of ABM like functionality inside of them. Marketo has certainly done that. So I would say think about how complex you want to go. If you have the technical progress, go for it. If you don't, there's ways to do it without having to invest in that up front. So ABT, always be testing. Start small, think big, run fast. You know, it applies to everything we do in technology. But yeah, it's great that we had the progress and we could implement a platform, but there's ways to do it where you don't have to necessarily make that upfront investment. And you can grow into that, you know, as you start to prove it out, then, you know, start to invest in that technology. So I just wanted to, don't necessarily, but that's what we did. I'm so glad you made that point because I I feel like what we're seeing quite a bit with with our clients and through the startup market is maybe they don't have the buy-in to invest in something. And maybe their pilot is something simpler to prove that this technique actually works so they can get the buy-in for the platform. Maybe it's a phased approach or something like that. But one thing we're also seeing and, and questions that we're getting is there are so many ways to do this. There's so many rabbit holes to go down. There's intent data to look at. There's custom landing pages. There's personalized. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do. So how far, you know, from a tactics perspective, from a very nitty gritty perspective, how deep did you get? Did you start with custom landing pages or did you just start targeting these companies and see what happens and learn from that? We did build a custom landing page and it was all around financial services and it had, we would commissioned a, a report and we took extracts from the report and created many, you know, small digestible pieces of content from that report. So we didn't, you know, hey, go download the 66 page, you know, study we did, you know, you know, we just took it into smaller pieces and we started to try to educate stuff top of the funnel, really educational and then sort of get, well, if you, you know, it was, it was very, it was almost no content about Aerospike. It was just pure educational. Here's some content to start to educate you on why your data architecture matters if you're trying, you know, if you're a financial services company and how you need to rethink what your data architecture really is and that kind of stuff. But we did do a custom landing page. What we didn't do, which I always wanted to do, was, you know, we didn't have a CDP. We didn't have some of these systems where if somebody came to your website, they would see a very custom version of the website based upon who they are and and their behavior that you've had with them. We never did that. I didn't make that investment. Always wanted to do that. I thought that'd be really cool, but we didn't get to that level. We didn't we didn't get to that level of sophistication. You know, one of the challenges that everybody's had, you know, in the last forgot eighteen months is just an overall, you know, softening of, of the market, compression of marketing budgets, compression of staff. Frankly, a lot's been written about 
lots of MarTech proliferation, you know, thousands of solutions, and you're starting to see some of those things going away. And so when I got to the company, I found out that they had invested in all of these things, most of which hadn't even been used. So I had a basic North Star that was, we're going to get rid of everything until we can prove that we can actually do something with it. I'm not going to pay for it. Don't want the complexity. I don't want it to blow up something, you know, and I was just killing things that I didn't even know people had been investing in to simplify the stack. I would caution people to not overly complicate the stack. Start simple in general and then add complexity as you can and as you think it makes sense because it's another integration. It's another thing that might screw up something else and just proceed with caution. But there were things I wish I had done, just didn't get around to it. But some of, there are some pretty sophisticated tools out there that you can make it, you can do personalization at scale, which is the challenge with all this is how do you do personalization at scale? So we didn't talk about some things we did that didn't work. <laughs> We're happy to talk about that if you'd like, but personalization at scale is, is a challenge. Yeah. Well, we're not going to let that pass. So uh, <laughs> what did <laughs> what did you think was going to work and ended up not? Well, we got a little ahead of ourselves and a little, you know, mm -hmm. overhanging our skis, so to speak, where we started to micro-segment. VP of sales is very eager, rightfully so, that within the financial service, there's a lot of very micro, there's small segments and in other segments. And so we had a goal to try to roll out like nine segments in 60 days. That means you had to go get the accounts. You know, you had to go to Zoom and you got to find them. You got to go load them into your systems. You got to build messaging. You got to build content. You got to build everything. And we said, okay. And, you know, I had a team of people crushing themselves trying to do that. We just couldn't do it. You just couldn't pull it off. But boy, did we try. But in the effort of doing it, we took our eye off the maintenance of the programs that were working. And so you would see in those charts how flattening of the addition of pipeline from the other verticals that were working. And it absolutely just diluted all the things that were working because we were like, oh, well, now let's just go big, you know? And how can you get a BDR to talk with any credibility about nine different segments? You just can't train them, you know? And so we were like, holy smokes. So they would like try to bring in subject matter experts or people if we had them on every single sales call to help them be able to have a conversation, even in the early stages. It just doesn't scale. So be careful about your segmentation. Be careful about this is where hyper complexity actually hurts you because you're adding a lot of complexity. And can you actually scale that? And I, if I were to do it again, I would never do that. I would try to do it at the higher level of segmentation and audience and try to find the common denominator where your message and your solution cuts across a lot of different micro verticals and not try to get that sophisticated because that was just a lot of smart people trying to be really smart and that ended up not working very well, right? So we, we ended up turning that thing down. I'm so glad you shared that story with our startup marketing friends who are listening to this because I feel like the startup culture is be nimble, run, let's go, let's do all these things, let's get results. And then you start to see results and you want to make it bigger and better and you've got to bring in revenue and all of these things. So I think that's a, a really, really great point of almost like a don't come running right out of the gate kind of thing. Like let's Slow and steady does tend to, to win the race. So, so we talked about what was a little bit more challenging, what didn't quite work. What was easier than you thought to get up and running and maintaining? Aerospike still does this day as a fantastic product marketing organization. We were really good at producing high quality content. You know, I won't take credit for that. I just had really good people on my team that did that. And you know, we became kind of a content factory. You know, we just were just really good at even taking content that had already been produced and repurposing it. And, you know, we were good at doing webinars. I think we, we knew the topic. We knew the subject then. We were really good at being able to crank that stuff out. And hats off to the product marketing team and, and the subject matter experts that, you know, weighed in and, and did that. A lot of B2B marketing is, you know, how good is your content? And it isn't just creating content. It's about creating good content. And it's about creating content that your buyer persona finds valuable. And we were just really, really, we were really good at that. And, you know, all the things that you read, even that article that you mentioned earlier, talks about the importance of really good content. It's not the volume, it's the quality and the relevance of the content to your audience. And I take for granted that that came easy because it took a lot of work. When I got there, we didn't have a lot of that content, but we got good at creating content. 
And so by the time we did ABM, it wasn't difficult for us to be able to create content. We knew what content was. We knew what top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel content was. That was relatively easy, but there was a lot of work that happened before we did ABM that sort of set that up. But content is really, really important. What do you wish you'd known before you went into the ABM sort of motion? And I guess what advice would you give for other companies like right at that start? It sounds like a journey you've shared, like start with a pilot, have a long-term view. Maybe if you can have the system, make sure you've got the content to fuel it, make sure that you're partnering with the sales team. But what do you wish you'd known going in? Well, one thing that caught me and I, I <laughs> died on the sword on this was, you know, all of these systems that track the account level, doesn't matter what platform, there's this notion of anonymous visitors to your website. Yeah. You know people from the company are coming. You know they're coming a lot. You just don't know who they are. And so what I really struggled with was convincing sales that, look at, I gave you Zoom info. <laughs> you have, you know exactly who the buyer personas are. You actually probably, if you went through and looked at the leads that came in from those accounts, you actually have people that you have actually talked to before. Do not concern yourself with the fact that if I tell you an account is heating up, that I can't give you exactly the person in their phone number, in their home phone number. That's why we gave you all those tools. And that's frankly what a BDR organization is for, is to go be the Marines, to do the, the trench work, to go figure out who was it? Who are the people coming to the website? I can't give you their names, but I gave you all the tools. That was a struggle. That was a struggle. And I just had a hard time convincing a very impatient sales organization to go, why am I paying attention to all this? Because you can't deliver me a name and an email and a phone number. And I go, well, I gave you everything around it. You just have to go do the hard work. And that was just, it was a very difficult, difficult thing for us, you know, and I would suggest to anybody try to make sure it's clear up front when you go in that that's the expectation and that you set up your BDR team and your SDR teams, whatever you call them, to be able to use those tools, to be able to go root out. And it may be that you never find them. But, you know, what I would say is, is well, you could cold call or you could warm call. You can cold call a bunch of companies that have not been to the website, or you can try to figure out who's coming to the website. What would you rather do? I've been in sales. That's what I would tell my team to do. But it, it takes time. You know, sometimes, you know, impatient salespeople are like, ah, you know, I'm just going to go do what I used to do. It's hard. It's a constant, constant battle, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give to a startup team that isn't huge? Because a lot of startup marketing teams aren't very huge. So maybe they don't have, you know, a team that can fully devote their time to ABM or have the resources to bring in some consultants or some experts or something like that. But they know that ABM is going to move the needle. What advice would you give to them as they were just starting out on this journey? Keep it simple. I keep it dead simple. I mean, do a pilot. Don't try to do it without doing a pilot. Agree on the pilot. Agree on it. Start small. Get a small team of people that are experimenters, that, that like to try new things. Set the expectations. Look, I don't have a light switch. It's not going to turn on. We're going to do this together. We're going to learn together. And it's going to take time. But keep it simple. Do not go buy a bunch of technology and throw at it. That's going to take you a lot of time. And that is just not the way to do it. You can do it, man. You could probably do it in spreadsheets if you had to. It's really very simple if you break down what you need to do. But keep it really, really simple. And continue to educate people. I'm doing it now with a client, and I'm continuing to educate people on what it is. I put together a basic overview of this is what ABM is. This is why it works. This is... Why it's a strategy, not a, it should, shouldn't be called about account-based marketing. It's an account-based strategy. These are the components for one to be successful. And I'm still having to go back and remind people because it takes time until you kind of, like anything else, until you get on the bike and ride it and fall down, do you realize what it is to ride a bike and to ride a bike? And it's, you got to get in and get experience with it, but you just have to keep reminding people what it is because for people who haven't done it, it's new. And, you know, as marketing people, our job is not only to educate the market, it's to educate the company on the strategy and making sure that they understand it. And, you know, sometimes I forget that. I go, okay, I told you once, you're going to remember. No, I got to keep back and I got to keep coming back and telling you. And that's to be expected because it's you're building muscle and uh, it takes time. 
that's brilliant advice. I think working in startup marketing, there is always this impetus to work quickly and for make things happen. Expect instant results. This is a long term commitment, but it can really play pay dividends because it's a stra- it's a re- it's a strategy. And if done right, as you did at Aerospike, it helped them move into a new vertical, several other verticals thereafter, and really sort of start scaling and standing out from in a very competitive area. And so that's sort of testament to that strategy working. So our next section is called Fired Up Five. And this is our quick fire round uh, in which we ask a few personal and uh, sort of general questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. Take it away. Yes, I promise these questions are much easier than, than the kitchen sink we just threw at you, Bill. So first up, what would you do if you were not in marketing? I'd be a teacher. I've always wanted to be a teacher. I really enjoy trying to instill or pass along knowledge to other people. I've had a chance as a manager to be able to watch people grow and mentor people. I've been able to lecture at the university level, both undergraduate and graduate. And it's just fun to see people's eyes light up and, you know, hopefully be an inspiration to them and help them on whatever their life journey is. What's the best career advice you've ever been given? Wherever you start is probably not where you're going to end up. I actually started as a commercial banker. And uh, yes, I was actually a commercial loan officer and I lent money to all sorts of interesting, medium, small and medium-sized businesses and learned a lot. And I actually learned accounting to the point where I got honors in my graduate school in accounting. And look what I'm doing now. It has nothing to do with it. I think the most important thing is to get going in a career, take the best shot at what you think you're interested, but just you'll learn as you get out there as to what motivates you, what you're good at, but don't stress it out because, you know, stressing it out at the front end doesn't help you. It's just like anything else. Get in there, mix it up, learn. and And life will take you in the direction you're intended to go. I believe that to to my core. And then I would say, just don't ever hesitate to ask for advice. Always seek out advice. Always look for mentorship. Always look for people who can help you. Networking is not just networking. It's just how we learn. We learn from other people. We learn by engaging people and asking questions. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know something. You know, you're going to learn. And by the way, failure is to be expected. I wrote an article on that and posted on LinkedIn. Go have a read. Congratulations, you failed is what I called it because we all fail. So rather than put your head between your legs, learn. What did you learn from that? And then, you know, always be growing through your failures. I mean, celebrate your successes, but failures to be expected. Love it. Love it. Go check out Bill's article, everybody. So speaking of a good read, what book do you most often recommend? Well, there's some non-business books I really like, but I won't bore you with that. You know, one of the ones that I've glommed on, and it's been around for a while, was by David Merriman Scott called The New Rules of Marketing and PR. And I almost think it's a must read. It really challenges companies to think like media companies. I mean, you're basically publishers now. You're publishing content. And your content really is what's going to help your audience come to you and respect you as being an authority. It was just a brilliant book. And I've given it out to people. It's been, it's old now and David's moved on to, to other things, but it, it was, I think he was really sort of behind the whole HubSpot inbound marketing revolution we all witnessed, but it, it's a great, great book. I learned a ton from, from that book and have tried my best to apply that, you know, many, many times over. Cause I do believe, you know, we have to think about the content we publishing is publish as what people want. They don't, they don't really want to talk to a salesperson. They want to learn, you know, educate them. Educate them on something you you have credibility to educate them on, and they'll come want to talk to you to learn more. It's a basic idea, but I think I think that book really framed it in a way that I understood. Love it. So I, I'm curious to see the answer to this one and see if it's a commercial banker, but what is the strangest <laughs> job you've ever done? No, that wasn't the strangest one, I can tell you that. In college, I actually, I was a bartender on boats that gave tours of the San Francisco Bay. It was kind of comical, but it was, if you got a tip, it was a good thing. You dressed up in, in little navy like suits, like the love boat, you know, with the little <laughs> bars, and you know, you greeted the guests. And we went out on the on the San Francisco Bay, and sometimes they were just high school grad parties, and sometimes they were other celebrations. It was a load load of fun. The one that I liked the most was the guy who was celebrating his wife's 
it was an, a birthday or an anniversary, but he was out on a sailboat, you know, sunset cruise, put all of his guests on the cruise boat and they met in the bay. And it was a surprise party on the bay. And he and his wife stepped off the sailboat and everybody said wow. surprise. And they had this fantastic party as we cruised around, you know, seeing the sunset through the Golden Gate. And I mean, I just enjoyed being part of that. It was just a really, really cool experience and then they tipped well so that was <laughs> that, that was a good one some of the high school grad parties didn't tip as well as those, but i don't know if that was unusual but it was certainly it was certainly was memorable definitely memorable and and sailboat guy wins for a lot of good reasons so finally <laughs> what hot trend have you got your eye on right now oh man you know everything's ai right i mean you can't like wake up without getting hit in the face with something about ai it's a hot trend, but it's an important trend. I think it's real. You know, it's funny, you know, we, uh, I live in Silicon Valley, and so we, we all like the new, new thing and all that. You know, I know a lot of people in the Midwest who have nothing to do with technology, and they're like, huh? You know, we're always on the bleeding edge of these curves. But that's hot, and I, I, I spend as much time as I can trying to understand it. I think it's evolving. There's a lot I don't understand. There's some things that don't work for me. This example today, I had a, a, had a problem with a platform, and I we've all done chatbots. We've done Siri. But the chatbots on a site yet have yet to impress me that they can actually answer my questions. I mean, out of the time, times, just please give me an agent because all the way they program those things don't necessarily work for me. Maybe that's just me. But I think there's some real promise to it, particularly in marketing. Yeah, certainly in the content creation side. Uh, I think on the data analytics side, you know, on the sales side, I, I think there there is some potential there. I worry about bots trying to impersonate themselves as human and damaging brands because they're not humans. And so I think there's a fine line where those bots do the job, but they don't substitute for real human interaction. And I think you got to be, we have to keep an eye on, on that for sure. But I think there's a lot of opportunity out there that I don't even understand that is difficult because it's just coming at such a pace that, but I, I do, I do spend time on that. I actually play around with tools. I've been able to use tools effectively. Some of my still haven't figured it out, but I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around it by actually using the tools and understanding what they do and what they don't do. But that's, that's an obvious trend, I think. So Bill O'Dell, that's a former CMO of Aerospike and is now a fractional CMO. If people want to get in touch with you, where should they go? Well, I, I built a little website all by myself. It's odellmarketing.com. Go check it out. Um, read all about my background, what I do, how I think. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's really simple. Bill Odell, no apostrophe. You can contact me through either of those platforms. There's a way to reach out to me. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I'm happy to just help. I'm passionate about what I do. I don't necessarily need anything from you. But if you need help from me, you want my advice, as I said, I like to mentor people and coach people. Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Thanks so much for your time today. Really enjoyed catching up with you. And uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Well, that about wraps it up for today. But before we close, we did want to offer all of our Fired Up friends a chance to grab a mega pack of all of our ebooks and guides. That's our guide to content marketing. That's our startup guide to paid media using Google Ads. It's our guide to attribution. You can get all of those over 100 pages of goodness at firebrand.marketing forward slash fired up freebies. That's freebies with an S. And we hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please give us a rating wherever you get your podcasts or drop us a note at firebrand.marketing. And as ever, the details of how to get in touch with our guest today can be found in the show notes. Thank you for listening. And until next week, get out there and crush your marketing goals.